All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, this is today's CNCF live webinar, Thinking Like a Threat Actor in Your Kubernetes Environments. I'm Libby Schultz, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct, and then I'll hand over to Abhinav Mishra, Director of Product Management, and Raywant Tamana, a, con a consultant, both with Uptix. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee, but there's a chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please feel free to drop questions there, and um, our presenters will get to them as they come through as many as we can within the time limit. Um, this is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such a subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct and please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link and the recording is available on our online programs YouTube playlist um, and will be online later today. With that, I will hand it over to our presenters to take it away. Hi, everybody. Th thanks so much for joining. Uh, Libby, can you hear me? Are we good? Yep, you're all good. Cool. So thank you so much uh, for joining. I'm Abhinav Mishra. I'm a director of product at Uptix, where I lead the containers and Kubernetes security. Uh, Raywan, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, hello, all. I'm Raywan, and uh, I'm working as a consultant at Uptix, and I'm mostly focus on the Kubernetes security side of things. Thanks for joining. Awesome. So we went through intros. Um, so I'll skip, I'll skip through that. Those are uh, always things we can get later too. But the real thing is um, Kubernetes and of course the attacks that are happening. We The goal in our today is to really be able to think like a threat actor uh, when you're talking about um, Kubernetes incident response. Uh, this was a recent some recent findings from uh, Red Hat's 2023 Kubernetes security report. And there are some very interesting stats where this was one interesting point that 37% experienced revenue or customer loss due to a container or Kubernetes security incident. Uh, is a pretty large number across you talking thousands of customers and moreover revenue or customer loss is something that as an enterprise, we never want to experience. Um, similarly, we see, um, of course, vulnerabilities and you know malware and and sensitive data. You know those traditional things being looked at from a security point of view, but we're starting to look at other things such as the supply chain and how that comes into the fold um, as we to uh, respond to incidents such as you know the solar winds attack or log for J vulnerability, and so. The real thing is now threat actors are now Kubernetes security experts. We saw this in cloud uh, when you know the cloud adoption was happening and uh, threat actors knowing how to manipulate IAM roles and get inside of cloud environments. And now we see the same thing um, inside Kubernetes clusters and across the container supply chain. Um, and so it's very for, important for us to be able to think about how a threat actor um, goes inside of, of Kubernetes and, and performs attacks, for example. Um, now the analogy um, I like to give is, if you think about a robber when they enter a house, um, some of the questions that he or she would want to answer uh, to be able to do the attack is, which room am I in? Or where are the security cameras? Where are the valuable items? Notice that they're starting to ask these questions to start to drill down into specific parts of the house that they can attack or valuable items that they can steal. And this very much maps to Kubernetes, for example which room am I in may map to a specific pod or namespace that you enter in when you enter the cluster. Where are the security cameras? There can be data like Kubernetes audit log data, which is having a track of the audit, seeing what people are doing. And that is data that, of course, you want from a compliance point of view, uh, but that's data that A, can be exploited, but B, also you need to protect um, against your Kubernetes environment. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those nuances there. The valuable items, of course, can map to secrets or sensitive data. And you know the other rooms that you can get into, for example, lateral movements, Kubernetes network policies. And of course, the doors that I can open 
relate to access controls and role bindings. So all of this forms a very holistic picture in terms of how do we look at um, threats? What is threat actor thinking about um, in the context of Kubernetes? And we'll dive deep into some pillars and frameworks around how to think about this. Now, before uh, we get into more detail, this is something I always uh, like to share in terms of tools. So, um, you know, there's this concept of red teaming. And of course, with red teaming, you're really, you know, going in, trying to perform attacks, you know, reveal uh, misconfigurations or vulnerabilities. And there are tools and frameworks that exist out there that can really help you uh, think about how to simulate these types of attacks. You don't know what you don't know. And you know, anecdotally, you know, for example, there there are things like, you know, how does a container breakout work? How does privilege privilege escalation work? There then there's frameworks and, and tools out there that can really help you, not just understand what those are, but actually try them out and simulate them. A uh, Kubernetes Goat is one really good example where uh, they talk around you know different types of attacks from the control plane to the data plane in Kubernetes. Um, and help you simulate those attacks and understand what remediation steps you can take. Um, similarly, uh, Cubehound is another one that was recently introduced by Datadog, and that one goes into attack paths for Kubernetes and how to think about the different attack paths and uh, get inside of a cluster, for example. So these are tools that I highly recommend um, You know, looking at, really being able to think about what would a threat actor do uh, to simulate the different types of attacks. Ray, want any uh, perspective here from your end as well, being a Kubernetes security ninja? Uh, nothing in specific. I think you have covered most of the things. And once we go through the demos, I think we'll cover all these things again. Cool. So the first pillar uh, that I'd like to talk around is visibility across your supply chain. And supply chain is something that's been getting a lot of um, visibility. You see, we've seen great thought leadership from uh, the folks at ChainGuard, for example, um, and you know even the analysts like Gardner talking about it. So, what is the container supply chain? Kind of how does it play into the different types of attacks? So, when we look across the supply chain, you know we're not just talking about your Kubernetes clusters anymore. If we work backwards, we're talking around looking at things like container images that are being built as part of my uh, pipelines, for example, in Jenkins, or being stored in container registries, for example, Artifactory or ER, and even going all the way back uh, to the actual you know GitHub repos and the code and the PRs where they're being built. And going even back to the developer laptop, where the blast radius and attacks can start from. And so it's very important to have a holistic view into all of this, because what can happen is any misconfiguration or any vulnerability or malware can be introduced in any one of these parts of the supply chain. Um, so it's not just being able to proactively um, or reactively remediate from a runtime point of view, but to be able to be proactive and catch these issues earlier, for example, when a container image is being built and be able to enforce certain policies and guardrails. So Raywant is you know, uh, one of our Kubernetes security experts. And Raywant, do you want to go over this quote and uh, sort of your perspective on what it means? Yeah, sure. So this quote has been coined by me like when I was preparing for my black hat talk on supply chain security. And when you observe the trends about supply chain security, most of the attacks happen just because the companies don't know how to patch the systems. It's not like they don't want to do it. They procrastinate or they are not interested in patching the systems. It's just they don't know where to look for. They don't know what their system is made up of. And that's when the attacker comes in and he tries to understand your system better than you do and all the things start to fall. So that was the context about writing this. And I think the next slides would cover a bit about the supply chain security or the different components and things. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks, Raven. So let's take a specific example, right? Um, you build a container image, for example, and there's certain things, right? Like we talk about image signing where, you know, you have maybe Docker trust, you've, you said, Hey, the image is signed and attested, um, by some authority. So, Hey, we're good there. Similarly, we're doing scanning at the registry and CI level where the image is built. We're scanning for vulnerabilities, including at the layer level. And you think you're all set, but 
it's about having kind of that snapshot point of view each time, so for example, an image is built and being able to look deeper. So imagine like we were just, you know, I'm I'm someone who maybe likes to get insomnia cookies delivered every week, for example, right? Um, and maybe, you know, the 10 months that they're delivered, um, they are so far so great, but I'm in November. And, and not to call out any brand, actually, let's not say insomnia, let's just say any cookies, for example, they're just getting delivered. Um, and we look and, and we have to understand at that point in time, what were the ingredients used to make the cookie? Was it safe at that given point in time? What are the contents of the cookie on the inside, right? It's not just, you know, we see the chocolate chips on top, but is there something inside that is malicious or, you know, something that I cannot eat? What was the state of the factory when the cookie was being made or in the context of the container image being built? Each, it's very important. So there are a couple of factors, right? What, what am I looking at at that given point in time? So a snapshot point of view and also being able to deep, or deep, dig deep inside of the contents of that thing and not just taking an outside of peripheral view. Um, and that's something that's really important in terms of looking at specific vulnerable packages, for example, in the container image. Uh, Raymond, I'll delegate this one to you in terms of you want to talk about this specific example. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Abhinav. Uh, so regarding the supply chain security that we just discussed a few slides earlier, this is a part of the same chain where there are faker and color js packages of npm and they have been compromised directly by the developer he introduced some not malicious code he just made sure the packages stopped working and there are numerous thousands of other packages that rely on them for faker js the weekly downloads is around 6 million and for color js it was around 20 million weekly downloads mm -hmm. and there are around 20,000 packages that depend on ColorJS. So when ColorJS is affected, all these subsequent packages and all their users are also affected easily. So that's the entire path of supply chain where the core component gets broken and then everything that's using it starts falling into pieces. So mm -hmm. that's where you have to look into different things like how your software is built, similar to the cookie case. You're seeing a cookie and you know what it is made of then you can easily say okay you don't you have diabetes for example you don't want to take in sugar when you look at the ingredients you can say sure this is having sugar so i don't want to consume it similarly when you have a software if there is any vulnerable package and if you have a pre-composed list of it that will help you to immediately patch the systems that's mm -hmm. where the contents of the image comes in and similarly the traceability and provenance as well like if the image can really be trusted. Uh, for example, if you are downloading something from NPM, there are some packages directly coming from the Node.js maintainers. And there are some third party packages that come from different contributors in the open source community. So how do you know which one to trust, which one not to trust? Or it's inevitable that you'll have to use the things eventually. So even when it is coming from an untrusted uh, author, you might end up using it. Or maybe you might be using a real package, but there can be some other package that's using the untrusted package. So how to map all these things? That's a really challenging problem. And that's where the seriousness of supply chain security kicks in and all the other things around mm -hmm. it. And one question I have for you is, you know, we've heard a lot about S bombs and, you know, being able to have that in terms of understanding specific content, for example, um, as for example, in an image, can you talk a little bit about that and some of like the pros and cons around S bombs, for example? Sure. Uh, so S bomb stands for supply chain software bill of materials in supply chain. And what it basically does is similar to cookie on the back of the cookie, we get the ingredients, like what it is made of and how much of each, uh, what's the quantity of each ingredient. Similarly, when it comes to software, we just explain like, okay, we have a Node.js application or a Python application, and it is using one package. Let's say if Python, it's using Flask, for example. We only stop at Flask, let's say in the requirements file, or when it comes to Node.js in the package.json, you look at only one entity, but it subsequently downloads multiple transitive dependencies. And usually we tend to leave 
them all and that's where the s bombs come into picture where it will try to keep a storage of all the transitive dependencies as well for you and then when something happens you'll have a chance to look up to see okay if you have 100 applications which are the applications that are using a specific package and you can easily map the things awesome awesome thanks for that so one other example I'd like to talk around is um, admission controllers. Now, there's, of course, a lot of positives with admission controls. For example, they're able to enforce sensible and secure defaults. You can use them, for example, to say, hey, only allow trusted repositories and enforce when um, maybe there's um, images, for example, being pulled from untrusted repos or not allowing insecure resources to be deployed, for example, wildcard or ingress controllers or overprivileged service accounts. But when you're thinking like a threat actor, uh, one of the things you have to account for is let's, are they going to uh, attack the things that are not obvious and the, the things that are actually you think are doing secure things, but maybe if attacked can be even worse, right? If, for example, if somebody goes into my house and attacks the security cameras, uh, then they have access to everything. And we may think those security cameras are secure, but we also need to think about when attacked, what can happen. And admission controls, uh, of course, act as a, a key guardrail, but when attacked can be extremely malicious. Um, so the key challenge is how do I know that my admission controller is secure at any given point in time. And so one example we have here is a uh, mutating webhook configuration where um, we see that uh, we wanted we want to do a kubectl run nginx and this is very common right just you know pulling and deploying an nginx image. But it turns out there was a mutating webhook that was deployed on my cluster that is actually uh, leading, uh, instead of pulling nginx, when we have this command, it's actually pulling a malicious image. And so you have to watch out for uh, these specific configurations at any point in time. It's not just say, like, we have the admission controller, it's deployed on the cluster, and we're all set. We have to look at every, we have to have continuous uh, posture over what those admission controllers, mutating webhook configurations, and other key components uh, of our Kubernetes uh, control plane and data plane are doing. So there's a blog here by Rayvon. You can feel free to check this out around how to create these malicious admission controllers, set this up, and we'll dive deep into a little bit of a demo um, towards the uh, second half of this uh, talk. So one example, uh, Rayvon, do you want to go into this crypto mining example? Uh, sure. So just adding on to what Abnav has mentioned about malicious admission controllers or the malicious mutating webhooks, there are different ways an attacker can gain persistence on the systems. And once a system is compromised, the attacker wants to stay in the system as long as possible without being caught. So they can get the most benefit out of it. And one way to do that would be leveraging this mutating webhooks and they can add an init container or a sidecar to each of your deployment. So let's say you're deploying a application, a Node.js or Python or Golang application. You just expose it on a service through a port. And once you make a deployment through Jenkins job, your application gets deployed and it will be accessible to the outside and you start using it. But you don't really tend to look at what's happening behind the scenes, at least not often maybe sometimes we do that so let's say if you have a sidecar running along with your application and if it is running a crypto miner it will run in the background it will not tamper with your application it will not stop your application from running so whenever you try to use it it gives you a very good performance considering you are able to access the application but in the back end that doesn't work like that your system is compromised or the resources are being consumed or there can be an attacker sitting and monitoring all the network traffic. So how do you detect these kind of things? We do have the CIS benchmarking from different companies or from different vendors, including governments like uh, organizations like the NSA and Department of Defense, but they only look at the static scanning side of things. How do you prevent or look at this dynamic side of things? That's what our main aim is on runtime security. So we'll do a demo on this, so I think it will get more clear. Yeah. Should we start with the demo? 
uh sure so we'll so the first demo we'll try to do is how easy is it to set up a crypto mining service on a kubernetes environment so when compared to monolithic systems the kubernetes systems are quite different so let me know if you can see the screen so this is a website called mining pool stat where you can look at all the crypto mining um, sorry all the cryptocurrencies what happens and we are looking at the monero service for example and these are all the different pools that are available for us where you can connect with them once you mine you can send out the results to it and then you'll be getting the money and you can see the number of concurrent miners at a point of time as well as what are the connection settings? How can you mine something and connect with these pools and the other port numbers like a SSL port and a non-SSL port? So the first thing would be we'll need to have a configuration in order to run the crypto miner and we'll use something called XM rig. And here the URL will be getting it from this page. And similarly, you can create a new user information. So whenever you mine something, you get the profit out of it. But for this use case, I'll just copy a random user's ID and then we'll just use it over there. And then we'll just do a simple deployment where we are trying to pull a XMRIC image. So even if you check on the Docker Hub, it's quite famous, like all the attackers have been using it and it got more than a million downloads, I mean, million pulls, if you see on the right side. And the others are some basic configurations. So first we try to create a config map of the configuration. I think it already exists because I was just testing out before the demo. We'll just delete it out and then create a fresh one. So once we create a config map with the username and the URLs where it has to connect with, we will use this to load it into the XMRIC deployment. So the main idea behind showing this is to demonstrate how easy it is to have a crypto miner running in the world of Kubernetes or the containers, unlike the monolith applications where you'll have to do so many other things. And once you have, you can configure everything starting from number of threads or the CPU usage, the memory usage. So if you are putting it to very low, the users will not even find any difference in it and it goes on so i think yeah that's a bit uh, that's a very short demo on how we can level crypto mining and the, the configurations are available on a github repository we'll share the links post webinar and if you want to try you can just do a quick hands-on demo as well and we got one more to explain about the mutating webhooks i think We'll do that after this. Yeah. Over to you, Abhinav. Yeah. Thanks, Raywin. So that was a great example where um, sort of being able to think like a threat actor, trying to actually simulate the types of attacks uh, proved to be very valuable. And understanding, for example, of of course the pros of admission control, but when they are compromised, what the what are the kinds of things they can lead to? So just um, you know, only going to spend a minute on this in terms of. Takeaways, um, always have point in time snapshot of your security posture. Not It's not just about starting the monitoring, but of course, making sure that in a given point in time, what am I looking at? And making sure that we're relying on a combination of the following for images, not just, of course, scanning and signing and verification, but also looking at provenance and traceability um, as explained before. So uh, for time purposes, I'm gonna move on to the next pillar, which is, um, you want to, when we're looking at attacks, right? Um, there's a big question around where do we start, especially if I'm new to Kubernetes, and you know from the data, um, 
it seems, you know, the best place to start is to start with our back and to dive deeper. And one data point is uh, this is the MITRE attack framework for uh, containers. And if you look at across pretty much all these buckets, right, um, there's always some element of um, our back, right, that comes into play because there's always a question of, you know, how do I get in? And once I get in, of course, there's a lot of different things you can do, but it's that initial sort of key to the door uh, to make sure that, um, you want to be able to at least protect that and understand, you know, what are your auditing, uh, your permissions, you want to be able to understand uh, the different controls and access controls you have in your system. So I'll give a couple examples. Um, so here, uh, this was uh, from, um, you know, uh, Aqua Security, and they talk around um, RBACs and, and cluster roles. And this is an interesting one because we noticed that there's a system controller a cube controller a name for this cluster role. And what happens sometimes is we're in this mindset saying, hey, this looks like something that is a system role. Uh, let's allow for it. But it turns out this system role has all excessive permissions. And so it's very important that uh, to understand that threat actors will try to hide behind benign names or components that seem important could actually be harmful or could be exploited. Uh, in this case, even though um, it's this was a cl custom cluster role that was called the system name. And so it seemed benign, but was actually malicious. Um, so, and one important thing to note is that misconfigs can also be introduced via human error or using defaults. So many times in our clusters, we have default service accounts that have, you know, star permissions across the cluster. And while those are good from a DevOps point of view to just, you know, quickly try things and get started, when we're thinking about enterprise security, we have to understand to, that those default service accounts um, should not actually be used on the cluster. And if they're lying around, uh, they can pose major, major threats. Um, and here's an example um, in terms of lateral movements via default service accounts, where say you're using a shared EKS cluster and you have team alpha and team beta and the different namespaces here. Uh, we'll notice that What's happening is that um, while well, you know the namespace alpha one and namespace alpha three in this case have uh, locks in them, namespace alpha two is using a default service account that has cluster wide privileges assigned to it. So if any malware appears in the namespace alpha two, it can actually spread to the rest of the cluster and laterally move. And so you need platforms, you need an understanding of what are those um, RBAC misconfigurations, uh, not just in terms of um, at the cluster level, but at an individual namespace level as well. Raywin, do you want to discuss this one around uh, zero trust and IAM in the cloud and how it relates uh, to your Kubernetes service account security? Uh, sure. I think Adnav has covered a wide range of things, starting from the supply chain security and the other pillars for RBAC. And this falls under the similar scenario where we are trying to enforce the zero trust model or trying to have a least privileged access in the cloud environments. Because in the cloud environments, when you had an uh, issue or when one of the components get compromised, you want to make sure the blast radius is less. For, let's take a scenario where one of your application fetches, takes a file from the user and tries to upload it to an S3 bucket. So how do you make sure the authentication between your application and the S3 bucket is secure or it's in the best way possible? And one way or the simplest way to do would be using the IAM users in AWS directly. But in that scenario, you'll have the keys directly within your application. And if that gets compromised, an attacker can easily extract that and reuse that to authenticate to the S3 bucket, or if those credentials are having more privileges, like if they can access the other resources like the RDS or IAM, then that will be even a bigger blast radius. And the one would be to attach these roles directly to the nodes where your pod is running on. And even in that case, there have some scenarios where uh, if it gets compromised, the blast radius will be huge. The more secure way and the one that AWS recommends is to use the OIDC providers like the IAM roles for service accounts, where you try to have a tight binding between your pod and the S3 bucket. 
So we won't go in great detail, but there is a blog post available on that. So if mm -hmm. you are interested, you can have a look at it. But mm -hmm. the main idea of showing this is to say how easy it is to just take the wrong path in order to achieve the goal. If mm -hmm. you see, there are different ways to connect your application with S3 bucket, but it often depends on how you are doing it. And in case of compromise of the pod, what are the preventive controls you have or what are the defense in depth steps you have to take mm -hmm. care of that? Mm -hmm. And Raven, one thing around um, service accounts and sort of our back, like role bindings in a cluster, can you talk around the difference between, um, for example, if I'm scoping to a namespace, right? Um, there's a difference between sort of object scoping versus permission scoping. Do you want to talk about that? Or I can dive a little bit into that. Yeah, sure. I think you can. Yeah, so one thing we want to account for as well is even if we have the logs, right, say we're scoped to a specific namespace, we also have to look at permissions inside of that specific namespace because tomorrow if that namespace is compromised, say there's um, an open, there's no network policy for that namespace and it's able to laterally move and talk to the rest of the cluster, we have problems. And so that is something that also doesn't get enough attention, not just looking at what are we scoping the permission to for a given developer? For example, saying, hey, that developer only has the ability to talk in what name in X namespace, but what are the permissions inside of that namespace as well? If, for example, say the developer is compromised and they accidentally delete audit logs uh, because they have the permission to in that namespace, and tomorrow we need to, uh, we see that namespace led to some compromise because um, the the permissions were changed. The you know something you know it led to um, you know laterally lateral movements inside of the rest of the cluster. Then we have a problem as well. And so it's not just about the scoping of the, your role bindings in Kubernetes. Um, you know Kubernetes, of course, is cluster role binding and just the generic role binding where generic role bindings are typically used for namespaces or pods, but it's also about the permissions with that role binding and what, for example, um, a developer from an in a developer self-service model is able to do within that context. So just wanted to address that as well. So for RBAC, in terms of starting with RBAC and diving deeper, always have a way to monitor your identities in and across your clusters. Uh, leverage concepts such as IRSAs and pod identity. This is actually something that uh, was, for example, introduced at, I think, reInvent this week to, to map Kubernetes service accounts to core IAM roles that are properly managed and audited and leverage concepts such as OIDC to make sure you secure, have secure access to resources in your cloud. And of course, you can leverage security platforms or tooling that helps you answer key questions about your RBAC posture. Um, of course, when you have thousands of thousands of apps, you want to have high level questions that you can answer. And we'll, we'll go into that in a little bit further into the call. but. Cool. So, Raven, do you want to go uh, into another demo? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let me uh, share my screen, and then we can just have a quick look. So this is uh, a demo from to end perspective, where you have an application, and how does an attacker leverage it, or how does he try to gain the persistence within the system? So in this scenario, we have an application running on this specific uh, IP address and port. And if you see, it's just a regular application which got a whole set of features displaying multiple things, uh, like the integration or some examples as well on how to use it up and some configurations and tags and so on, many other features. And as a user, you'll tend to just use this application in a regular way. But when it comes to the security side of things or when it comes to the attackers, they try to enumerate the application and try to see what it's built of, similar to the cookie example that we discussed earlier, trying to understand what a cookie is made of. And if you see, we can see a bunch of information about it, saying what's the server type and what is the target host name. So there is something called showcase action that we are seeing. And Nikto is a tool that allows you to look through the web application banners and fetch some information. We got some information, but it's not really helpful. 
so far. So what we'll try to do is we'll try to use a tool called Nmap that will allow you to scan the specific port or the entire service or the subnet to look for what are the open ports that are running or what are the kind of services that are running on the application or the system. So here, what we are trying to do is we are trying to scan specific port number because we know that is available. But for some reason, the server is blocking our ping probes. So we'll try to just skip that. And if you see, it shows scanning EC2 something. So it also tells you that this application is being executed on an EC2 system. And if you see, it is having some information like the server headers and the versioning information. So we can quickly try to search what kind of uh, things are available. And I just gave a space in my browser and it automatically showed exploit over there. So it is definitely exploitable or it's been a very old one. What caught my attention was the structs too, where so exploit DB is a place where that you can look for CVEs of the specific vulnerabilities uh, and stuff. So what we'll try to do is we'll just copy this specific payload, which is publicly available as a proof of concept. And since the system is not patched, we'll try to execute it and see if the end system is vulnerable for this vulnerability or if we can exploit that. So if you see, like we have the code and CV 2017, so it's a pretty old one. Mm. And we still find these applications every day. If you look at uh, Shodan or the other sensors kind of search engines, uh, maybe it must be Python 2. So, and it requires the IP address of the machine. So what we'll try to do is we'll just give the IP address of the machine and then we'll give the command. The exploit DB is having the entire code to bypass or leverage the vulnerability and perform a remote code execution. So I execute commands from my machine and they get exited on the application system. So if config.io is a website where you can get the public IP address of yours or any system, so this is my IP address of the server where I'm running on. And if I want to check where the, so what I'm simply doing is we are passing on the IP address of the URL and we are sending the commands that we want to be executed there. And if you see the IP address is different from my IP address and it gives the IP address of that machine, which of course we know from the URL, but just wanted to double check. So this is good for running one-to-one -one commands, but if you want to perform some extensive operations, it's not a feasible approach. You should get a shell on the system. And the way to do it is using a reverse shell, for example. And NC is Netcat. It's a tool that will help us to connect, make socket connections with the other applications and try to gain access. So here we just try to get a reverse shell payload from a GitHub repository. You'll find it all over the internet. It just opens a TCP socket connection from the source to the destination. So the destination would be my IP address and the port that I'll be listening on. So it's 1337 and this is my IP address. So once I execute this, we should be able to see a shell but first let's make sure there is communication between my server and the application that would be the primary requirement because we need to see if we can even access it so i'll try to do a ping command but the ping goes on forever so i made sure i'm giving like minus c1 so it will send only one packet and then return the response rather than waiting for it but still i didn't get anything so we'll kill that out and we'll put a timeout saying if in two seconds, if you're not getting any response, just terminate it. And you can see the 100% packet loss happened. 
So it means the application is trying to connect with my IP address of 5120.140.105, but it's not able to connect to this. So it can be because of multiple reasons. Maybe the outbound connections are completely blocked from the system. So that's the reason. And in those scenarios, you won't be able to get a reverse shell. But in some scenarios, maybe the ICMP is blocked. So just we are not able to do a ping. So we'll see if we can make HTTP request out of it. So we can be sure that at least the system is able to connect to the outside servers using HTTP request. So I start a Python server on my system. And then I just try to make a curl or double get command. Uh, yeah, I think the code is missing. If you see the request came and we are able to see the response. So this clarifies or ensures that the system can make connections, but the ICMP is blocked, whereas the TCP connections or the HTTP connections are open. We tested for HTTP. Now we'll try for TCP. There are reverse shells available in HTTP as well, so we can get HTTP reverse shells. So that's not a constraint for us. And now what this simply does is it will open a TCP connection and it will pass on the bash terminal over that socket connection. Um, we should get a shell. Sometimes there can be some network issues and it will take a couple of seconds, but usually it should be instantaneous if all the connectivity is good. We'll just try again. We'll just restart it and it should usually work. Yeah, so we have a connection. If you see who am I, like I'm the root user. And also if you see the host name, it is the IP address of the, uh, sorry, if the host name is different from mine, but some web something, it clears up that we are on the victim's machine or the application. Yeah, so if you say it is, so usually this is a structure for a pod. It will be the name of the application replica set and some random values. And we can see at all the processes available on the machine. So now since we know it is running on Kubernetes or we guessed it, we can try to enumerate system. But in this specific scenario, since it's made for the demo, I know what's exactly wrong with it. So we'll just look at the service account available because that's a common thing that is done by all the applications. They mount the service account into the Kubernetes environment or the deployment. I think Abhinav has covered this in the previous thing related to RBAC. So it falls under the same category. So what we'll try to do is We are trying to connect with the API server from here. So for people who are new to Kubernetes, um, service account simply gives you a method to authenticate to the API server and perform some operations. So it's like your authentication token, we can say, but it got tied with its own set of privileges. So sometimes you can say it should not have any privilege to do any operation or sometimes you can give it wide set of privileges. So we'll use that to connect with the A server and see if we can perform some operations. So if you see all these uh, values, we are trying to connect to the API server and we are able to get some values from it. And similarly, we'll see if we can list secrets in a Kubernetes environment using a similar method and yeah so looks like we are able to list the secrets as well this is all cool but this is all the read only access so you can extract the tokens and if there are any api keys stored on your kubernetes system you can easily extract when this kind of misconfiguration happens but what we are interested in is something more 
so this is my blog on where i just write about the security side of things so this is something we just discussed on the malicious admission controller so this is how the workflow looks like in kubernetes you get a request that passes on through multiple phases we'll not discuss in detail but once the authentication is successful it comes the mutating place where you can mutate the request once you have a incoming request you get to choose if you want to pass it on like that or if you want to make some changes to it and now we are exploiting that specific component also have a github repository on the same so if you want to try it out you can do it uh, post the webinar or whenever you feel so it's a simply a go code it will try to connect with the api server sorry when an application tries to connect with the api server it performs some mutating operations on it yeah since we are here we don't have access to connect to the kubernetes api server directly we are communicating using curl by token service account token to authenticate but nevertheless we'll just check if there is any cube config in the system there's nothing over there we did the find command so we'll just use a curl in a same but this time instead of just listing the secret Secrets, we'll try to create some secrets or create same spaces. So for that, I have done was uh, we will be creating a hook demo. All this content is available online, so we'll share it once the webinar is done. Own as well. So the CS cert and token for authentication. Once we have the namespace instead of yaml it will be in json because we are passing through a curl request and then we'll send the request to the api server and you can see the status is active because it's instantaneous and namespace creation and we got the response so similarly we'll create the other services as well that are required to create a mutating webhook so these are the certificates so nothing much over there so just create it directly it really was for time check it's 1250 so just one heads up sure thanks um yeah six more minutes and then so if you see the image it's uh, pointing to my docker hub repository so either we can look at that or maybe we can skip it out and just deploy this specific file so that would be the same we'll just download the file using wget as a curl request to connect with the api server and deploy it and the status is still pending because deployment takes time unlike namespaces and this is a service that we are creating to connect with the deployment and then yeah the service is also created and similarly we'll create a mutating webhook this star of the center operation where it connects with the service to perform some muting operations on every object that goes to the api server So if you see it is successful, but let's just check the status of the pod. So this is the API server. If you see the namespace, we are just looking at the demo namespace specifically. And it is successful, like the image is referring to my Docker Hub and we can see the status and it should be it running over here. Yeah, the container status the state is running so now we have deployed all the things but what does it mean for us using curl and overprivileged service account because the service account is having more privileges like write permissions we are able to write things to the api server directly from your 
pod. So I already have access to the cluster, so we'll try to create a new pod and see if this what does this metadating webhook do. So we'll just switch back to our demo namespace where we'll just try to create an nginx image but this time if you see it is unable to pull but nginx is a public event anyone should be able to pull it but when you try to analyze the errors you can see that it's trying to pull a different image overall it's trying to pull a malicious image even though you're trying to get nginx running so this one was meant to interrupt the way it works, but if an attacker wants to gain persistence, what they'll try to do is they'll inject a sidecar along with it, or they can have an init container. So you can never detect it, or at least not in a regular fashion. So if you look at the mutating web, it will have a bunch of things, but eventually it connects with a service where and then we can look at the so if you just look at the code what it is doing the colang code related to the service it's trying to replace every request and first image that is available and it is replacing it with a malicious image so that's what the mutating webhook is doing so Often all the companies rely on CIS benchmarking or compliance in order to test these kind of things. For example, Kubescape is one of the most famous uh, benchmarking tool for Kubernetes. If you try to use that, and uh, I'll just do a quick clone on the local system, and we'll see if there are any checks related to mutating webhook configurations, because you have seen how devastating it can be or what kind of impact it can have on a system where it can gain the persistence it can do defense evasions and stuff so if you see there are so many matches to mutating before but all of them are coming test data folder which is purely there for testing purposes as well as even the other ones are just exams so if we are just excluding those folders the cubescape is not having any kind of checks related to this and none of the available tools can do a check on these kind of scenarios where everything happens at a runtime. So even when you try to run a compliance scan, it will be all green, all checks passed. It says you are compliant to everything. But in real, your stuff is quite compromised or it's having so many other issues. Uh, over to you, Arnav. I think that's wanted to show. Cool. Awesome. So we have only a couple minutes, so I'll just uh, quickly go through the last things where Ravens was talking around, um, you know, compliance and and being able to, um, you know, it's not just a control plane thing, right? We also have to look not just at compliance, but also runtime uh, telemetry and security. And if we look at runtime security, it relies on observability. You don't know what you don't know. Um, and so if I'm looking at, for example, um, any cluster, uh, this is just an example of an EKS one or anything. Uh, of course, you want to look at control plane data in terms of audit logs or things coming from the Kubernetes control plane. But you also, when you have a good sec uh, security solution uh, to be able to tackle the kinds of threats that uh, Ray Wunth was demonstrating earlier, relies on eBPF telemetry. And some examples are like looking at specific processes that were started. Um, for example, maybe the init sidecar is looking at network events in terms of like the TCP, the other connections that were started inside of the runtime or looking at specific files that were manipulated or changed. And so um, what you want to do is from the pillar three takeaway in terms of collect correlating telemetry, you want it across your data plane and control plane. You need to start with observability and really have some kind of data lake that you can start to collect this data because you don't know what you don't know. And you want to leverage not just um, the control plane data, but eBPF telemetry and even forensic techniques potentially, such as Yara rule scanning. I'll dive into a little bit of an example there where 
um, basically, you know, your process could be hiding behind something uh, benign, and you want to be able to analyze the signature of the process uh, in order to be in order to understand what's actually hiding behind it. Um, so, just last couple minutes, um, you know, there are security platforms uh, that can help you, you know, really uh, tackle a lot of these security challenges. And in terms of the pillars um, that we talked around, the first one are being a, a, around supply chain, where, for example, platforms like Uptix can help you have that single pane of glass view from the developer laptop to your identity providers, from code to cloud. And it's really about having a single golden thread that allows you to understand the overall um, sort of the overall attack surface and how a threat actor got into each of the different components using a detection graph. Um, in terms of starting with RBAC and going deeper, this is just a simple example, but where you want to up-level certain questions, especially if you have, say, thousands of namespaces or, or many service accounts. For example, we have 64 and 79 cluster roles. We want to understand which particular ones of those can access secrets or can exec into pods. And so you can answer these questions at a very high level. Um, that helps you being able to enforce more of a strategy that actually makes auditing policies real rather than just having to do it on a quarter to quarter basis. For example, if some new service accounts comes in and can access secrets, you can have alerting mechanisms to be able to act on that data. And finally, being able to correlate that data plane and control plane telemetry here. For example, we see this 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 .8, um, and it says QWER, but what's really happening is that that's an end map. That's uh, enumerating, enumerating vulnerabilities and doing a port scan. And that's where, you know, uh, using different forensic techniques such as Yara rule scanning, which is actually looking at the process, a uh, signature of a process and saying, hey, based on the data we're seeing, this is actually an end map that is being executed um, is really, really important. And making sure, of course, you're not just looking at uh, control plane data, but also runtime data um, at the process level to understand what is happening. So I know we're uh, at the minute, but um, uh, you can reach out uh, optics.com. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Abhinav Mishra, um, and you can reach out uh, to me or to Raywan at any time. And uh, you know, thank you so much for uh, joining this conversation today, and we really appreciate it. Thank you both so much. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, like we posted in the chat, the recording and slides will be up later today on cncf.io. Um, thank you both for your time today and for all this great information. And um, we'll see you all again on another live webinar soon. Awesome. Thanks, Libby. Thanks, for everyone. Thank you. Bye.